Welcome back, everybody, to Franchisors.com. Uh, thank you all for joining us once again. We have a wonderful guest today. We are coming to you live from Carrollton, Texas, here at the Fast Science International Headquarters. Uh, we have the lovely CEO, Catherine Monson, joining us today uh, to talk through uh, the 11 questions that we have for the Franchisors.com uh, Summer Franchise Tour. Uh, so, Catherine, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, what we want to do first is just to uh, kick off and have you uh, discuss a little bit more about when you first actually got to Fast Signs, because for those who do not know, uh, Catherine has had uh, a very well-established career in the franchise space, uh, especially starting in the business services space uh, prior to her uh, prior to her coming on as CEO at Fast Signs. Uh, Catherine would love to kind of hear uh, what was one of the first things that you did from a team member perspective uh, that you really felt was super important to start off with. Okay, so I like to say I've been in franchising more than 20 years because when I say 39 you can figure out I'm really really old and for all the money that I pay for on anti-aging products it's really stupid to give that away uh, I've been at fast signs here for ten and a half years and uh, had, I mean it's a wonderful blessing to be able to come into a really well established brand but we had become a bit complacent we had kind of gotten to a point where we felt we were number one and so we stopped innovating and stopped working and as hard and so what I want the first thing I did was focus on creating a culture that is uh, growth oriented and results oriented um, not pro it's not about process it's not about being business busy it's about results mm -hmm. and put together um, you know values and throughout our building you can see our, our company values um, but really creating an environment uh, that focused on franchisee and franchisee success and focused on growing the company and focused on great results um, and so I think that that would be the single most important thing. Now, I came to the company in January 2009 in the depths of the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. And so really for the first year, we were focused on helping our franchisees get through that very difficult time. Uh, as you know, the small business community was, was very badly uh, impacted, very significantly impacted by the Great Recession. And so we focused very much on very tactical things, how to help them grow sales, how to help them manage expenses, how to help them improve cash flow. We had a whole program and initiative around that. But that would say the culture of the team and focusing on the franchisee's success was the single most important first thing that we did. Absolutely. And I, and I was going to say, too, um, on that topic, when you did first get here, I, I imagine that, you know, sales was tough because now people didn't really have a lot of money. And it wasn't just for you guys. It was for everybody in the franchise space. Um, but I do imagine that your process in terms of you actually when you actually did get down to selling again, that your selection process has definitely changed since you first came on board. Uh, so love to kind of hear a little bit about, you know, your first class of franchisees after you guys got down to the nitty gritty and started selling. Again. Well, you know, I'm, and I think I'm. I, I th we, we've done a great job at Fast Signs for this entire 10 and a half years that I've been here on picking uh, outstanding, strong franchisees uh, that understand what's involved in, in being successful in a Fast Signs. But I'll tell you that what generally happens for a brand new franchisor, a startup franchisor, and emerging franchisors, they will get excited about selling a franchise to anyone that fogs a mirror. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they understand the values of the company, that they understand the model, that they understand that being part of a franchise means you learned the brand, you learn the business model, and you implement it. You give input on how to improve it, but you don't innovate yourself as a franchisee. Uh, another mistake that startup franchisors often make is give huge protected territories thinking that somehow the size of a territory leads to the sales volume growth of a franchisee, they're not related at all. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've been very good and consistent. Uh, Mark Jamison is my partner in growing this business. He started with the company in January of 2009, and we've been completely aligned with looking for franchisees that are passionate about our business, that buy into our outside sales, expanded products and services focus. Uh, and that are committed to building the brand and following um, the business model, because that's what it's all about, right? Um, and so I think that that new franchisor can very often just think about anybody who wants to buy a franchise. Um, there have been a time or two where we've sold a franchise and we realized very quickly that that person was not appropriate for us. I can think of one, I'm not gonna mention any names, but the, franchi the new franchisee was abusive of our team. He cussed at them, was rude. Uh, we talked to him. He said he'd change his ways. He didn't. And so we just refunded his money and sent him back. Because 
while it takes a great team, you can't keep a great team if you have franchisees who are being rude and abusive. And mm -hmm. this gentleman was just rude and abusive. It's just his behavior. So sometimes you might make a mistake. And then if you do make a mistake, you want to uh, correct it as quickly as you can. Now, if someone's already in business and then they've, they're not following the model, they're not able to, you've coached and you've counseled and you've coached and counseled and they're still not doing what they need to do to make the business successful, uh, the next step we would take would be to encourage them to sell so they can they can get out of the business and we can get somebody else in the business. Absolutely. Yeah. On the topic of differentiating the franchise offer, um, how do you differentiate your franchise offer from smaller and larger rivals? Uh, because there's a lot of competition out there. So how do you, how do you differentiate? Well, um, certainly part of our differentiation at Fast Signs is that we are the undisputed leader in the signage and visual graphics space. We have highest we have more locations than any of our competitors. You know, we might have one competitor who would debate that, but then if you actually count the number of locations that they have, very often they're talking about large international numbers that are very difficult to substantiate. We have the highest average unit volume. We have the highest profitability by franchisee. So by any metric, we are the leader. Uh, but at the same time, we don't sit back on our laurels, right? And so what we're doing is we're uh, very um, focused on finding great franchise candidates. We exhibit at the best shows. We're using search engine optimization and other ways of attracting candidates. We're um, participating in things like franchisewars.com and, and looking for ways to find great candidates. And then it comes down to having a really outstanding team of folks that are talking to those candidates about the Fast Signs value proposition. Um, our guys aren't thinking about how do I sell a franchise. Our guys are thinking about how do I find the right person that's going to be successful running this Fast Signs location for whatever city we're, we're talking about. Uh, and then we also have a, a part of our process where any candidate has to spend some time with Mark Jamison, who's going to make sure that they understand um, what Fast Signs is all about and what we expect of our franchisees and the kind of involvement they're going to have to have and how hard they're going to have to work. You know, franchising is not a guarantee of success. Franchising is a proven business model with a proven brand, with proven training that works, but you still have to work it. This is not, you know, you don't get to sit back on your laurels and not work very hard. Absolutely. So on the topic of your product and service, I think you just touched that, but what advice would you have for an emerging brand whenever they're looking at differentiating their product or service from their largest competitors if they're not the biggest, if they're not the baddest? And are we talking about from the franchisee level, teaching the franchisee yes. how to differentiate? Okay. So first is you got to have a good, you have to have a good offering, right? So if you're just some other, let's just pick something. Your burger is no better than anybody else's sure. burger. The experience of getting the burger is no different than the experience mm -hmm. of getting a burger anyplace else. You're going to be hard pressed. But there are really great ways to innovate. You know, I mean, just take a look at some of the more uh, recent um, burger concepts. You know, whether it's the experience or whether it's that you can get it from buffalo or you know elk or whatever, all kinds of mm -hmm. different ways of innovating and, mm -hmm. and and doing things like that. I think it really comes down to you got to have a product or a service that really va is valued by the customer, that really meets a unique customer need. And depending on what business you're in, you're just going to have to study the market and figure out how to innovate and be better. Absolutely. And, and I would love to switch gears a little bit um, to talk about something that I know uh, you are passionate about. Uh, matter in fact, you were the person that I learned this term from for the very first time. Uh, so uh, when you spoke at Springboard uh, is uh, about union economics. Um, I know that you were somebody who really pioneered educating the franchise space on this, so would love to kind of have you discuss uh, how you, what unit economics really is and what it means to you first, but in addition to that, um, how you've used it to really um, make your business uh, move forward. Well, to have a successful franchise brand, it has to work for the franchisees and it has to work for the franchisor. Mm -hmm. The franchisees have got to make a good living. They've got to be able to get a great return on their investment. They've got to be able to build wealth for their families, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, only then will you have a long-lasting franchise brand. If only the franchisor is making money, that's never going to work. So it all comes down to what I call unit-level economics. Taking a look at that, whether you call it a box or that business, how does the franchisee make money? And so we've been focused on that um, from the very beginning. 
Uh, one of the ways we do that is we do an annual financial benchmark survey uh, where we're getting full year financial statements from our franchisees using a, the same chart of accounts and then crunching the numbers and taking a look at those numbers. And then we're segregating out what we call our profit leaders or our top quartile, and we're studying them and learning the best practices that they do and teaching the rest of our network about that. Now, interestingly, the best practices that they do are the same best practices that we taught them from the very beginning, but it is always good to test that out and make sure that that's true. So in addition to teaching franchisees those best practices, like what we find is our most profitable franchisees have fewer but more highly paid, highly productive, highly trained employees. Mm -hmm. So they get good people, they invest in them, they cross train and develop their skills, they pay them more than they're gonna be able to get across town at the competitor. Because of that, they stay longer, which means they learn more, which means they're more productive, which means they bring more value, right? And so they have fewer but more highly paid employees. Because there are fewer of them, even though they're highly paid, the franchisee has a lower payroll as a percentage of sales because these are highly more productive employees. So that's one of the best practices that we look at. We also have been very diligent at negotiating with vendors, whether we're talking about for equipment, but more importantly for supplies and services, mm -hmm. bringing down the price that our franchisees pay. Uh, we call that a ceiling price. We want to reduce the ceiling price. We want to continue to press that down. At the same time, we're teaching our franchisees, if you're buying something big, maybe you've got a huge order and you're buying pallets of a certain substrate, even though you've already got our lowered price, you ought to ask the vendor, because it's a huge order, can I get a little bit more of a discount? If you're buying a piece of equipment, there are certain times of the year or times of the quarter where it's better to be, you know, a sales manager wants to make his quota, he wants to get his bonuses mm -hmm. for the year, right? So it's the end of the quarter. That's the time to buy that piece of equipment and say, well, wait, wait, I know what the fast signs price is, but I need something more, right? So we're also saying, Let's push the ceiling price down from a corporate standpoint, but then you keep asking for more. The worst thing that happens is they say no, right? I'm sorry, you already got the best price you can have, right? We are able to, one of the things we love about um, selling conversion franchises is that we then find out what they've been paying from the same vendors for equipment and supplies and substrates to really validate how great our cost savings are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that unit level economics thing is all about how do we help franchisees be more profitable. One of the th big changes we've made in the 10 and a half years I've been here is focusing not on commodity products and services because there's no way our franchisees are going to make good money selling a low price commodity. But instead focusing on higher margin products and services and you know getting into interior decor and, and you know just as as you take a walk around our office, as an example, this table, um, and you see that I mean, no one's gonna go out and competitively bid this table, right? This is a brand building table. We can do this, our franchisees can do this for any customer, but we keep bringing in those creative ideas and those success stories, uh, and that helps them sell those higher margin products and services. So you're selling a higher margin product and service, you're paying less for your equipment supplies and substrates, we're helping you train and develop your staff so they're more productive. Um, we're teaching you all the different ways to help improve your profitability. That results in kind of long-term benefit and growth in franchisee profitability. Thank you so much. I think that that will be really helpful for a lot of the emerging franchisors uh, watching and listening because, you know, I think people toss around that term a ton at these franchise shows and, you know, especially when you're small, you, you kind of get lost in the shuffle and you feel like that you know, you don't really know what some of these words mean. So I think that that not only uh, not only will they now know what it means, but they will have some ways to be actionable about it. So thank you. Um, uh, next, I wanted to just uh, get into your franchise leads and kind of get on the franchise sales side of things a little bit. Um, we'd love to just uh, dig in more on you know how that's evolved and over time in terms of the lead generation you guys are doing because I I know that you guys are, are a very large business that has a very diverse approach. But we'd love to kind of get into that in terms of. Uh, what you've employed when you first got here and how that's evolved as the market has changed. And things like that. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna make you guys laugh. You probably don't even know this, but back in the day, like uh, 38 years ago, the way you generated uh, franchise sales leads is you took out classified ads in newspapers yeah. and in the Wall Street Journal, right? I mean, there used to be this other thing, this has nothing to do with franchise sales, but neither of you would know what it is. It's called a Yellow Pages. 
I know it's really a trippy thing, but you ought to Google that so you can figure out what it is, <laughs> just to let you young millennials know that there there was a time before cell phones. Um, but you know, if I think back to uh, you know 2009, we weren't focused on selling a franchise; we were focused on helping our franchisees get through the recession. Mm -hmm. 2010, we started to think about okay, business is coming back, the economy is strengthening. Now is the time to start selling franchises. Well, there was a time back then where just advertising on the portals worked really, really well. Well, now everybody's advertising on the portals, and they're not as uh, effective as they might have been 10 years ago or even 15 years ago. But we have a very um, diverse approach to generating leads. Not only do we sell new Greenfield franchises, but we sell conversion franchises and a co-brand franchise. A co-brand franchise is where you allow somebody in a related business to co-brand and keep their existing brand and also have a fast signs in the same location. Mm -hmm. And there are different ways of generating leads. For conversion leads, we can identify who those people are. We know who the sign companies are in open markets and we can reach out to them. Mm -hmm. That's a very rifle approach if you yes. think about it. It's not a shotgun approach or a sure. broadcast media approach at all. Um, we think about uh, co-brand franchisees again in an open market we know who those folks are so we can go after them directly we also exhibit at sign industry shows and we do that to attract conversion and co-brand candidates mm -hmm. for greenfield startup franchisees one just our well-known brand is amazing and our single most effective approach for generating leads is pr but i don't think that's going to work for a young emerging brand that works for us because we're the leaders in the industry. We're running television commercials regularly to build business of our franchisees. Mm -hmm. And the PR just is a natural fold into that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that works very, very well. But we also um, are exhibiting at appropriate uh, franchise opportunity shows. We're at the International Franchise Expo every year. We do some of the other um, franchise shows. Uh, West Coast Franchise Expo, as an example. Uh, we're also advertising in some of the portals. We're also advertising in the IFA's Franchise Opportunities Guide and with the IFA. But what uh, part of why we're so successful in this is that Mark Jamison, who I've already said uh, once today is my partner in, in growing this business, uh, he is constantly looking at those lead sources. And while one might be good in Q1 or in February, mm -hmm. as long as it's once it stops producing, he's moving to something else. So it's not like you can say, this is the menu, the menu works, order everything on the menu. Sometimes the menu changes or the ef efficacy of an approach changes. And so what I really respect about Mark is he's watching that on a monthly basis and making changes all the time. Being nimble, absolutely. So I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about franchise relations. Mm -hmm. um, can you share any secrets for how you have managed and maintained great relationships with franchisees? Well, I think, you know, it, it, I think this is franchising best practices, right? You know, number one, you focus on unit level economics and you really deliver in that area, right? You focus on helping franchisees grow their sales and you really deliver in that area. Um, one of the changes that we made, um, and maybe initially the franchisees didn't like it as much, but they really appreciate it now, is we now only use the ad fund to do things a franchisee could not do for themselves where in the beginning when I first got here, we would rebate franchisees ad fund money to wrap their van. Well, a franchisee can wrap their own van, they're in the sign business, right? So instead, let's use that money for big, broad things that they can't do, like being on TV. You know, we're the only sign and visual graphics franchise or on television. We're on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, CNBC. We're there Monday through Friday in the morning when folks are getting ready to go run their businesses and in the evening when they first come home. Why are we there? Because we know the decision maker for signage and visual graphics is news and information oriented. They're going to work. they got to run their business. they got to know what the heck's going on in the world, right? Um, and so we're doing the right things to help our franchisees grow their profitable sales volume. And then we're doing all the other things. One of the things that so surprised me when I came here is the management team here before I got here rarely spent time in the field. Uh, and when they did spend time in the field visiting franchisees, they only visited their buddies or the high volume franchisees. I mean, <laughs> everybody on my team spends time visiting franchisees. Um, Mark and I are on a race to see who has visited the most franchisees and I've, I'm winning 
and I will always win. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, if, if I'm in town, if I'm going someplace for a conference, I'm going to visit the franchisees who are there. I mean, it's just, it's part of our culture. You've got to be, you know, toe to toe, face to face, belly to belly with your franchisees. And then you got to say, how are things going? Are we taking good care of you? What can we do better? What ideas do you have that would help this whole network be more successful? You can have that great conversation in an hour, an hour and a half, right? But, you know, our management team didn't used to visit franchisees. I mean, it's just, it's just such a foreign concept to me. And then we also have several different franchise councils. We have a National Advertising Council Board of Directors that's elected that's helping us make the decisions on how mm -hmm. to best use the ad fund. We've got a Franchise Advisory Council for general things. And then we put together task forces for specific projects or, or products. For example, our point of sale system. We have a point of sale guidance group of franchisees, so they're bringing us ideas on how to improve that. When we have a particular initiative, think back some years ago when we were looking to um, reposition the company, um, we got together a, a group of franchisees, high volume, low volume, different parts of the country, different countries, to talk about and work through that process with us. So there's a franchisee involvement perspective that's in our business all the time. So it's all those things together. Got it. So I, I, I think that, I, I know that a lot of people in the franchise space uh, know you quite well, but since you, you, really are, um, you really are a force in the space, but I know that one thing that you consistently talk about is your culture, and I know that you've mentioned it uh, a couple times today, uh, is, is, is about you know how I feel like really feel that the culture really lives on, not only throughout the office, but also in the field as well. Um, as an emerging franchisor, um, obviously that can be really difficult uh, to start culture the right way. So how would you recommend that an emerging franchisor uh, begin to put, um, in, to, to begin to put a priority on culture and really how do you really ensure that it is instilled in everybody no matter if it's corporate or not? So every company has a culture and either it is either designed and created and maintained by the leader or it is designed, created, and maintained by other people. So if you have a CEO who is not focused on a great culture that values people, that, and then that means the leader has to do that as well, right? You can't say, um, we're gonna value each other and then go cuss out an employee, right? Um, I, I think the only time a leader should ever raise their voice is when there's a fire in the building, and I mean a fire in the building, and it's to say, get the heck out, right? I mean, see, there's no reason to raise a voice. There's no reason to, to demean people. I think that, you know, you, you uh, praise in public and you correct in private. I mean, they're just basic things, right? But one of the most important roles of a president or a CEO, the leader of an organization or a leader of a department is creating that culture that's focused on achieving the company's objectives, but doing it by, by valuing the inputs of every single employee. So this is a little bit of a sidebar, but we just held our fifth or sixth annual Bring Your Family to Work Day. We do it in the summer when kids are out of school. Um, and it's a two hour, um, 11.30 to 1.30 deal. And we invite, we have our, ask our employees to bring any family member. I mean, it could be their second cousin, we don't care. It can be their children, it can be their aunts, their uncles, their parents, their grandparents. We had some grandparents here. We do it in July. And I teach the um, ambassadors how I want them to give a tour of the building. We have banners or banner stands around the company explaining what each department does. And the role of those ambassadors is first, teach them that we're a franchisor and what that means, because most people think we're a sign company. We're not, our franchisees are. Uh, give them a tour of the building so they can see all of the great kind of applications our franchisees can produce and you'll see that as you walk around the building today and then the third is explain you know who's in the, who's in your tour you've got an employee in their family you make sure you cover how that employee is important to the success of this company right mm -hmm. so if that person is working in national accounts you're gonna say and let me tell you why national accounts is so important right they help expand the brand and you know it's no matter what it is and if that employee is in accounting you're gonna say let me tell you how important this person is they make sure we get paid every two weeks most important thing to any <laughs> single employee right so and part of that is just we value our people because um, reality is we don't have anything to sell all we sell is a business model and a great team that help franchisees implement it Absolutely, and, and so 
Uh, one thing uh, in addition to uh, culture and in economics that I know you were quite passionate about and that I really learned uh, just how much of a threat uh, this was, was kind of discussing um, you know, how your brand specifically and how you, I guess, uh, more, more specifically uh, deal with uh, you know, threats to your business model and uh, really from a legal, legal perspective, not only in the science space but in the franchise space, we'd love to kind of uh, hear um, how you deal with that and you know, how you get involved in order to ensure that that doesn't necessarily happen. And so are you talking about legal in the franchisee, franchisor relationship protecting the brand? Are you talking about um, trademark uh, protection and enforcement? To help me understand a little bit more what you're talking I about. I would say in terms of the franchisee, franchisor relationship and okay. all that because I know that you are incredibly involved with that particular aspect. Of the well, I, I would tell you that I don't ever want to talk to a franchisee about what is in the contract. I don't ever want to pull it out and beat them about the head and shoulders. What I want to do is use uh, influence and recommendation and suggestion. So we rarely bring the the legal aspect of, well, we were, you're required to do that, right? I mean, that's our last result, our last uh, effort. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is have great relationships with our franchisees. We're bringing value. We're openly discussing disagreements or challenges. We're finding a way to say yes. Um, one of the uh, things I've learned from Mark Jamison is find a way to say yes. There's a way to say yes while saying no, mm -hmm. and it it makes a difference in relationships, right? Absolutely. Now, if a franchisee said, I want to be selling pizza out of my fast signs, we would not say, yes, you can sell pizza, sure. but we would find a way to make them feel like we at least listened and we explained why selling pizza out of the uh, fast signs doesn't make sense. And and that seems like a funny, funny example, but years ago when I was uh, president of Pitt Printing, I had a Pitt franchisee who was in a smaller town who was also a uh, federal fire, uh, licensed federal firearms dealer, and he was selling guns out of his Pitt. Now, I'm pro-gun. I'm the most Second Amendment person. I got all kinds of guns. I'm concealed carry. Uh, and when you talk about a well-regulated militia, let me tell you, with all the practice I do, um, my shooting is very well-regulated. Um, <laughs> but selling guns out of the PIP did not make sense. It, was, it, didn't hurt, it hurt our brand. Not everybody feels about the Second Amendment and firearms the way I do, right? But I had to find a way to tell him, you can't do that. But I believe in guns. I do, too. Let me tell you, you're taking the guns out. Don't make me pull out the franchise agreement, right? Now, I never had to, but if I needed to, then I would have put him in it on default for, for doing that, right? But as crazy as it sounds, that's a real story. Wow. That is oh. a really crazy story. Wow. Yeah. So, anyway. So looking back, um, last topic, last question. Looking back uh, over the past 10 years, I think you said 2009 is whenever yep, you Yeah, January 2009. Tough time, as we've discussed, economic wise um, but is there anything that you would have done differently looking back over that past 10 years um, well while I have identified two mistakes I've made and I would do them differently I'm not going to be sharing them with you uh, because they're personnel issues right and and that wouldn't be appropriate sure. uh, but uh, you know I mean sometimes we take too long to uh, help someone exit the business when they're not being positive. We'll just put it that way. Sure. I mean, I just think, you know, the most important thing is that for us to do is to be focused on our franchisees and then focused on the market and the competitive threats and making sure that we're adjusting the business where we need to. Got it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. We really appreciate you uh, coming on uh, to uh, join us for this franchisors.com segment. Uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing you on the road very soon because I know we all travel very much, uh, quite, quite a bit here. So uh, look forward to seeing you quite soon. Thanks Great. Again. Thank you guys so much. It's been fun. Thank you.